Let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts. And as we turn there, we're, we're looking at something I think is fascinating. I mean, there's so many amounts of truth and challenge that we can get from, from this account this morning. Where we're headed is in Acts 24. And, and it really, it's, it's a question that we all could answer right now. So it's almost like I don't need to go through this process, but I want to go through the process to underline in your minds this truth. But the question is, how should we share the gospel with the rich, the famous, and the powerful? Because that's what Paul does. Uh, he talks to a 19-year-old girl that would be like morphing together, uh, you know, Miley Cyrus and Lindsay, you know, drug rehab Lohan and, and a couple of others all into one 19-year-old. I mean, she was generationally kind of a Paris Hilton on steroids, was the first person that, that Paul shares the gospel with, and her husband is kind of like a reincarnation of Michael Jackson. You know what I mean? Just think of that couple and that you get called in front of them and you get a few moments to share the gospel. How would you share it? Basically the same would, way you would if you were talking to someone at the rescue mission that was losing part of their mind from over-toxification of the, everything with alcohol. See, I think sometimes we think that maybe we should package the gospel this way if they're famous and rich and powerful, and maybe this way if they're, you know, kind of like indigent, homeless, whatever. Mm -mm. So you've already heard it, but I'm going to show you what I mean. So in the book of Acts, and I want you to think about as we're going there, of the millions and millions and millions of people that live before and during the time period of the Bible. Now remember, this, this book was written over a time period from around 1400 B.C. all the way through near the, nearly 100 A.D. So about 15 centuries the Bible was written. And in that time period, there were millions and millions and millions of people that lived on earth. But out of those, well, in fact, probably more than that, because I, I looked up uh, the, what is it called? The um, oh, Population Reference Bureau. That's a think tank in Washington, D.C., right there on one of those Northwest Avenues. And they calculate if the first humans showed up in existence in 50,000 B.C., which is probably the normal line in Washington, D.C., because they don't usually read the Bible. But uh, if they first ones showed up, they said that by the time of Christ, there would have been 40 billion humans. Now this is secular evolutionary, you know, thought. 40 billion people have lived up through the time of Christ. But of all those 40 billion, do you know how many we know a lot about? Very few. You know, the Caesars, you know, the, the, some of the leaders in Egypt, you know, the pharaohs and all of their hieroglyphics. But other than that, a few Babylonians, a few Assyrians, a few, you know, founders of religions. How many people do we really know any, their first and last name? How about anything about what they thought other than the people that are inscribed in stone? We know nothing about most. But in this book you're holding, God captured biographical, divinely inspired God knowledge about 2,938 people. Now, the way I know that is Wilbur Smith, a Bible scholar from a generation ago, spent his life counting everything, and he counted them and, and found how many people we know about. But, but my question to you is why? Why, out of all those millions and billions of people, do we have almost 3,000 lives mentioned? It's because God uses them to teach us something. He picked them, and he wants us to know about them. And as we return to Acts, and starting in chapter 2, we're going to look at individual people that are named, that are described, and God himself uses to unfold the most amazing story of all time. And what we're looking at this morning is the unfolding of the gospel. And as we pause to think more deeply about what exactly it is we're reading, think about this as we read these verses. We're reading perfectly accurate accounts of the personal words, of the personal thoughts, and of the actions seen mostly, only by God. Which is very interesting to think that God is watching everyone. He knows everything everyone is thinking and saying and doing, and he is, he is keeping a record of that. 
But out of that whole voluminous record, he just pulls this little file out. And that's what we have in Acts. Well, in the book of Acts, we're given an authorized record of the birth of the church, the spread of the gospel. And this account is from God himself. And if you look in Acts chapter 2, I just want to show you one little number. If you look at verse 41 of chapter 2, it says, Those who gladly received his word and were baptized that day were about 3,000 souls. So right there is, is uh, an amazing fact that God counted those. But I just want you to think about that as we look at the gospel unfolding because that is the beginning of 22 salvation message presentations. That record is preceded by how the gospel was presented, and that's where we started many weeks ago. But 3,000 people responded to it. But these 22 accounts that, that we're plodding through are exactly the ones that God wants us to look at. Have you ever thought about with all the people alive, you know, all those millions of people in the Roman Empire and all the billions of people that have lived up through the time of Christ, how much stuff is going on, talking and events and moving and losing jobs and getting sick and getting well and earning money and everything, and out of all that life, God captures 22 distinct little scenes. Now, those weren't the only times the gospel was shared. But God wanted us to know those. So I just want you to think as we look at verse 41 of the numbers, okay? So there are 3,000 people born again at a minimum during the first week of the birth of the church. Now, it, what it says is 3,000 souls were added to them. So we're pretty sure this number is men, women, and children. So 3,000 people responded at the very first invitation to the gospel. So that's pretty good. Now, keep going to chapter 4. So turn over the page to chapter 4. And so God in chapter 2 counts hearts and reports 3,000 are saved. And we get an updated count, kind of like, you know, a, a telethon where they keep, you know, raising what's come in. And, and we get a second numbering of how many people are saved. And that's in chapter 4, verse 4. And what it says there is, however, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. But now we've changed the way we're calculating. It's kind of like the way the government is doing the, you know, the NOAA statistics, which they quietly revise back. You know, they're trying to make everybody think that we're in this horrible global warming. We've got to change everything. But actually, it was warmer in the 30s than it is now. But, and, and few scientists pointed that out, that they were fudging the numbers, so they fixed them. But this is not fudging. This is God recording something. You know what he says? By the time we get to 4-4, there are 5,000 men. This is a euphemism for heads of households because that's how God looks at it. God looks at the man as the head of the household. That's the gender-specific role that he laid down. And so we're talking now about family units. Now, some of them could have been single men and some were just, you know, couples. Others are families were members of the families. But we have 5,000 units here of all different sizes that are saved. And that's the cumulative number. So with the count system used, like in the Gospels, it's probably uh, a lot of them are families. And so the church is made up of 5,000 family units of all sizes. And then if you add in what we know from 1 Corinthians 15, 6, that before Pentecost, there were 500 believers, solid believers. We know that. 1 Corinthians 15, 6 tells us Jesus came and met with only believers after his resurrection. He was never seen by lost people. So Jesus, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, met with 500 individual people. Those were the fruit of his ministry. Those were the people that got saved. Can you imagine from all over Galilee, everybody that, that had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as he was teaching, he shows up and said, that's me, I rose I'm coming back for you. Do what I left you to do. Can you imagine the thrill? But that's how the church started. And so Jesus, during those 40 days prior to his ascension, the 10 days prior to Pentecost, he ascends. But 40 days prior to that, he, he visited those solid believers. That means that by right here in chapter 4, there are at least 10,000 believers. Because a lot of those men have to be married. And, and it was talking about is that there are that there are 5,000 units of people. So I, I would just conservatively say 10,000 or even double that of men and women and children in Jerusalem and the outlying areas who were spirit-filled, quite enthused, and believers. 
Now, with all those numbers in mind, think of this. Think of the initial surge. It'd be like... Um, It'd be like getting a group of people in, you know, filling a stadium and getting them all pepped up to do something, and then while it's still ringing in the ears, they, they all go out and they do it. That's what's going on in Jerusalem. It, they're just blanketed. Acts records this ground floor event of the launch of the greatest event in history. Jesus is alive. Multitudes were being powerfully transformed by him. See, that's the difference between Judaism. Judaism was they just started getting in line with, you know, following all those rules. What was happening now is Jesus was coming and personally changing people directly. That's why when we get saved, we don't join Calvary Bible Church or wherever you were saved. We come to know Jesus Christ personally, face to face. We know him. He moves in to live within us. See, that's, that's what's different about every religion and Christianity. Religions, you join something. Christianity, Christ joins you. And me. I mean, it's just absolutely unique. And so God was mightily at work, and Acts is the account of how he kept that work of Pentecost going. The stadium is like Pentecost. And, and the people going out just were so excited, but how do you keep that going? Do you just keep calling them back to the stadium and reproducing Pentecost, which is what a lot of Christendom thinks is what's supposed to do, and so they try and reproduce the day of Pentecost nearly every meeting they have? Is that, is that how the Lord did it? See, we need to consider God saved people, and then God energized them, and then God continues to re-energize those early believers because they, like us, continued after they were saved to face hostilities and difficulties and challenges and all the mundane day-to-day -day things that just wear us down. Because life is hard. You know, it's, it just seems like uh, Elisha and I got the lawn mowed and it needs to be mowed again. You know, I mean, it's just like, it's like just got all the dishes washed and there's another load. And, and life just is so full of the mundane. So how do you keep them going? Well, God was at work in his church. And that's, that's, let's get to chapter 4. And what I want to show you is starting in the first four verses, what the Lord did and, and just, just, in fact, I, I uh, put it in here for you. Um, they, are, they are amazingly, look in chapter 4, and then we're going to read this in just a second together. Starting in verse 1, they spoke to the people and the priests and the captain of the temple, and Sadducees came upon them. This is after that, but I want you to see pre preceding this event. So the apostles get, get come upon. In other words, they're, they're, they're being arrested. And verse 2, being greatly disturbed, that's the leaders, that they taught the people and preached Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in custody. So this is the first persecution the church is facing until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of them came to about 5,000. So look at verse 21 now. We're getting down close to where we're going to read. So when they had further threatened them, that's the, the apostles, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because the people uh, all glorified God for what had been done. So here's the question. What happens to the regular believers? They're in the stadium, day of Pentecost. They get so excited, they get energized, and they get you know gloriously excited about the Lord. And all of a sudden they notice that that their leaders get arrested and roughed up and threatened. So what's the first response? Look at verse 21. It says, they further threatened him, but they didn't know what else to do. So keep reading in verse 22. Uh, they talk about this man that was, that was uh, saved. And then look what the apostles do in verse 23 of chapter 4 of Acts. And being let go, they went to their own now, companions in the New King James is italicized, means it's just understood, but it doesn't say it in the text. Do you understand, as soon as the apostles get roughed up and persecuted, as soon as they get released, they go to their own. Yeah, that's really interesting. That, that usually, that's a euphemism for they, they gathered with the church, with the believers. They looked at, in all of the world, of the billions and billions of people, their own were the other believers, the other members of the body of Christ. 
Now, they had relatives, but if they weren't saved, they weren't their own. You understand? They looked on the church as the closest, most vital group in the world to them. And so they went to their own, verse 23, and reported all the chief priests had done. And when they heard that, they raised their voice to the Lord in one accord and start this prayer. Now, verse 31 is after the prayer. And this is going to be where we're going to start this morning. This is our text because I want to show you something. I want to show you how the 22 scenes of Acts happened. It's because God is doing something behind the scenes. Like, let's see if this thing goes back. How was God at work in his church? Right here. He does something when people pray. And let's watch it together. Okay, you ready? Let's stand together. You got your Bibles. You can follow along. I'm going to read it from here because I, I want you to think about what it's saying. So they have this prayer. And when they had prayed, verse 31 says, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. That must have been an event. Exciting. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke. This is what's fascinating. Not in tongues. They spoke the word of God with boldness. Interesting. Verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believe were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of those things they possessed were their own. They said, everything I have belongs to you, God. What do you want me to do with it? They had all things in common. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. God was at work in his church, and we need to allow him to be at work in us today. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I pray that the truth of your word would dawn upon us that what you have done from the very first moments of the launch of your church in this world, you're still doing. First, you saved and, and put your spirit within them on the day of Pentecost. And then you kept saving and you kept putting your spirit in everyone. And when they faced adversity, all they had to do is pray and you filled them again with the Holy Spirit. But not so that they could be involved in some ecstatic worship service where they just helped each other out but you filled them with boldness to go out and speak the word of God that's the pattern for the rest of Acts and for the rest of the history of your church and it's the pattern for us today I pray that we would want and invite and welcome you to be at work in us your church and that we would allow you to re-energize and refill and embolden us, not just the missionaries, the Buffenbargers and Lakes going out, but us who are called to go out here in boldness for you. Stir our hearts, show us. I pray not just that, that we would hear what I'm saying, but that we would see what you say in your word and that that word would impact us today in a way that won't go away and that we will just keep inviting your re-energizing, refilling, and the renewal of boldness that we all need to keep going. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, note several observations you can glean from what we just read. I mean, before this verse, they suffered. They were roughed up. So what did they do? They prayed. I mean, that's amazing. They didn't retreat. They didn't, they didn't have to go in for therapy. I mean, they, these guys were physically, this is the first if you, I, I mean, that's something that I, I love to do. I count. I'm, I'm a real counter. And I count all the way through the book of Acts. And if you count, there are over 30 times that are mentioned in the book of Acts where people are roughed up, uh, beaten, uh, mob scenes, that they're threatened, that they're abused. And you know what? The people just kept going. 
Is that because they're made of different stock than us? No, it's because of this pattern we've seen. They suffered, they prayed, God shook the place where they're assembled, and then what happened? The, the question we're looking at is, how does God keep his church working? When they're threatened, when, when they have all this uncertainty of the future, on top of all the normal drag of life, that our bodies are getting older and everything's running out and we have to keep buying more. I mean, I look at it like the, uh, the great supply. I mean, I've watched my wife for 30 years maintain a household of, and it seems like every time I open the cupboard, everything's always there. And it doesn't, it doesn't just spontaneously get there. There is this constant drain and resupply going on. And we all know that in life. It's just like your gas gauge. It's just everything is running down, so it needs to be renewed. That's the same as how God knows he operates with us, his church. Was there another outpouring, by the way, as you look at this verse uh, that, that uh, I printed out for you here? Was there another? This was the moment that we should have had a second Pentecost. I mean, what should have happened is when they prayed and he shook the place and they were filled with the Spirit, they should have been speaking in tongues and doing signs and wonders. That's not how God operates in the Bible. That's how he is purported to operate all around the world. That's not the pattern he gave in the Bible. There was only one. In fact, when else do you see people speaking in tongues in Jerusalem ever again in the rest of the Bible? None. You would think that that mother church would have become like Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, the, the Mecca of charismatic events. What it became is the mecca of what God wants. He doesn't want us confusing everyone with something that some people have and some people don't, and we're comparing how much of it you have and how much of it you don't, which is where Christendom is getting today. When they got filled with the Spirit, they spoke the Word of God with boldness to people. And when we get to the first century Miley Cyrus event, you're going to see Paul boldly speaking to the rich and the famous, just like he spoke to the pagans and the poor. That's just how God operates. Was there another outpouring of tongues speaking reported in Jerusalem? No, not once. After the church was born in Acts 2, there was never another tongue speaking event in Jerusalem ever mentioned by God. And just let that sink in to your minds for a minute. If God would have wanted what we're seeing today perpetuated, we would see it perpetuated in the, in the Bible. He doesn't. Instead, if there was ever a time to pour out the best way to get the message into the world, it would be now. The moment we're looking at in chapter 4 is like D-Day for the gospel. It was time to spread out, conquer for Christ, get as many people impacted as possible with the power of God unto salvation. Instead of doing a repeat of Pentecost, what God does is God manifest his power in those early believers in three ways. He refilled them with his spirit because it's so much a part of life that our tires run out of air and our cars run out of gas and if we have an old leaky radiator, it runs out of water and, and our houses run out of food and paper goods and, and, and you know what I mean? And, and, and like our devices run out of battery power and so they all need to be refilled. And when God refilled them, God empowered them to speak his word with boldness. And, and at the end of the verse, if you notice what it says, look, it says, and great grace was upon them all. God poured out upon all of them his great grace. Not signs, not wonders, not having all of them ecstatically speaking. He filled them with boldness to speak the word of God. And, and I think we need to realize, you know, a lot of people say, oh, if we just lived in the first century, if we just had the first century, we have the first century power. We have the same setup. God is still offering a filling station. He wants to refill us. He wants to re-energize us. He wants to pour his great grace out upon us. All we have to do is want it, ask for it, seek it. He's right there. Well, why was God doing this? He's orchestrating the spread of the gospel. 3,000 people, look at chapter 8. These, these 3,000 and 5,000, God further describes them in the first four verses of chapter 8. And it says, 
because they were kind of like my beehive. You know, we have bees at home and only one hive this year. And when I open that thing up, I mean, they're just crawling all over each other. There are 20, 30, 40,000 sometimes in one hive. And they're just on top of each other. They're about 10 deep. On, they're walking and feeling each other in the dark, you know, and going to the right place and putting in their, their pollen and the honey and their feeding all the little larvae. Everything they're doing there in the dark, which is amazing engineering that God designed. That's what the Jerusalem church looked like. I mean, we're, we have 10,000 plus people crawling on top of each other. Just, it was just like a big Bible conference. I mean, can you imagine Peter and John and all the other apostles and James is given stories about growing up with Jesus in Nazareth and it's just, and the church is mushrooming. And God says, well, time for the conference to end. Look at verse one of chapter eight. Saul, consenting to his, that Stephen's death, uh, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And verse 1 says, They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. What the Lord was saying is, I want you to boldly go and pro proclaim the gospel somewhere else. You guys are just kind of in this big Bible conference, and, and you need to go. And so he uses the adversity of Saul and the persecution and so, verse 2, devout men carried Stephen to his burial. Verse 3, Saul made havoc of the church. He entered every house. I mean, you couldn't even be safe in your house church. He was coming right in, systematically going into every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. All that to say, I, I just read that to you because there must have been an immense amount of activity going on. I mean, these people were so fired up and excited and the Spirit of God was filling them. And so they said, boy, if you're going to drive us out, we're going to leave everything behind here and we're going to wherever we can go. But they never stopped sharing the gospel. And so there was soul winning and discipleship and worship and ministry and church gathering and so much more. But all of that whirlwind of events, that immense cloud of individuals touched and moved by the Spirit, the book of Acts only captures for us 22 little events. You understand, so much is going on. Why just these little ones? Because those are the events that God wanted us to know. So let's go to chapter 24, and I want to get you to the event, okay, the next one. So here it is. Uh, this is the 20th of 22. Salvation, and what we're going to see, we're going to read through this in chapter 24, and we're going to... Starting in verse 14, look at the Apostle Paul describing salvation as following the way of worshiping God. He says, I'm a follower of the way and I worship God. That is not how I've ever heard the gospel ever shared by anybody. And I know a lot of people say, oh, the book of Acts is transitional. It is. But this is one of the events out of the gazillions that were going on that God wanted us to focus on. And so as we focus on it, follow along, look at verse 14. And, uh, and just for the, the context of, of what is happening, Paul is dragged in, remember they tried to beat him up and he's dragged in in chapter 24 before the Sanhedrin. And uh, by verse 10, Paul is before the governor and his name is Felix, he's the Roman governor. And so what's happening is Paul is starting his imprisonments. And, you know, he, he ends up, this track leads him to ultimately his death, but, but he's just in the very first of his Roman imprisonments at the front end of it. And so he is being dragged in front of Felix, this slave that had a famous brother who was loved by the emperor, who was taken out of slavery and made a Roman governor of a very important part of the empire. So Felix was quite a guy. But Paul gets to talk to him. We haven't got Drusilla yet. And, and look what, what Paul says. But this I confess to you, verse 14 of Acts 24, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers. He doesn't stop there. This, this is Paul's gospel presentation. He says, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Verse 16, this being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Verse 24, 
And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, whoa, that's Miley, that, you know, the modern-day Miley. She's a 19-year-old that abandons one husband. I mean, she's 19, and I don't know how many husbands she's had by now. And, and she's going with this rising star, this, this provincial governor. So Drusilla, who was Jewish, by the way, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Verse 25, now as he reasoned, so this is Paul's gospel presentation when he gets Drusilla in there. He reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Wow. Okay, first of all, first question. Who did Paul witness to? Who, who we're talking about here? Two people we need to see. Okay, Felix and Drusilla. And, and look at verse 24. Do you notice a couple of names there? First we have Felix, and secondly we have Drusilla. Who were they anyway? Well, that's where a good study Bible is so helpful. In fact, I grabbed my MacArthur study Bible, my favorite study Bible, and I just flipped to Acts 24, and I looked, and here I'll read to you. Here are the, the notes that are at the bottom of the page. Felix, governor of Judea from A.D. 52 to 59. So right away we know when this is happening. This is happening between 52 and 59. And uh, that's helpful. Felix was a former slave whose brother, a highly favorite of Emperor Claudius, had obtained from him a position as governor. He was not highly regarded by the Romans uh, of his day because he accomp and he accomplished little during his term as governor. He defeated the Egyptians and his followers. That's in 2138. But he brutally angered the Jews. His brutality angered the Jews. And it led to his ouster by governor, as governor by Nero two years later. So that's Felix. Nothing real big. Drusilla. This is what the study Bible says. The youngest daughter of Herod Agrippa I. Now, now this is interesting. Now you can't see this, but I'm going to draw on it. It'll help. This is a family tree. This is the Bethlehem butcher. Okay, Herod the Great. This is the guy that killed all the children under two years of age in Bethlehem. And he had these children. These children are in the Bible. And what's fascinating is, uh, this one was all right. He built Caesarea Philippi. Uh, this is the one, Archelaus is the one, when Joseph is bringing back baby Jesus from Egypt, he doesn't go to Judea because Archelaus was just like his dad, and so he's in the Bible. Antipas is the one that Jesus appears before at his crucifixion. He's the one that beheads John the Baptist, and he's the one that built this modern-day city of uh, Tiberias that's still on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. So he's an interesting guy, Antipas. Remember, Jesus wouldn't even talk to him. He said, do a trick, do a trick for me. At, when Jesus is all arrayed in the robe, and Jesus wouldn't even talk to him. So here's the one that tried to kill Christ. Here's the one that basically allows him to be crucified and kills John the Baptist. Here's the one that Jesus couldn't even get near because as a baby, the Lord knew he was going to be killed by him. Now we have this one. This is the grandson of Herod the Great. And this is the one that was so proud he was eaten up by worms in the book of Acts, chapter 12. Well, this, Drusilla is his daughter. Now, it isn't as bad as these two. Wait till you meet them next time we're together. I mean, this one was living in open incest with her brother. They were the talk of Rome. They were so grossly immoral. This one just was a Man hopper. I mean, she couldn't stay married to anybody very long. Kind of an Elizabeth Taylor of the first century. You know, I don't know how many husbands Elizabeth Taylor, the late Elizabeth Taylor had. But this is the family tree. Now, I want you to think about generational wealth, notoriety, having anything you want. And basically, Paul is facing this teenaged, fabulously wealthy woman who is living in moral decadence and a rich and famous husband. And so what does he share as the gospel? Whoop back up. This is the outline of what he says. He says, starting in verse 14, believers follow a new way, and it's Christ. He's the way. And believers worship God, and believers, he says, I believe everything that's written in the Bible. Believers trust all of God's word, and believers hope in God, and believers believe in the resurrection and judgment to come, and they live a changed life, 
And they explained that faith in Christ involves righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Did you know what Paul did? Paul made it hard for Felix and Drusilla. Paul does not give an easy-to-believe, try-Jesus message. Note the audience that heard Paul's message. Paul is facing pagans steeped in sin, lost and doomed, and what does he tell them? He says people need to be told that God demands perfection. He told them about righteousness. That's where he started. He reasoned about righteousness. And what he said is this is God's standard and only perfect people go to heaven. Are you perfect, Felix and Drusilla? And Drusilla was starting to squirm her 19-year-old body in the chair thinking about the man she's still married to that she left in Rome and ran off with this latest one. She's only 19. Wow. The standard we share as God's representatives is that perfect righteousness is needed by humans. And then we share the bad news that there is none righteous, not even one, and then we point them to the source of perfect righteousness, Christ. That's the first thing Paul does. That's a hard-to-take gospel. You don't just say, I'm going to give you an offer that's too hard to resist. I mean, it's so good, you just can't believe how good it is. No, first he got them lost. And he told them about their lack of righteousness. Secondly, people need to be told that God demands that they conform to his absolute standard. It's required that we begin to live in self-control. Paul, look, look at what he says there. He reasoned with them in verse 25 of chapter 24 about righteousness, God's perfect standard, self-control, what happens to us when we get saved. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and starts to restrain us from the way we were. This self-control does not come from outward restraint imposed by others. It's an inward change prompted by God's grace. Paul always said that. That's what Titus 2 is. The grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Titus 2, 13. That's the gospel. Finally, people need to be told the third thing. Look, look at verse 25 uh, about judgment. Anyone who fails to exhibit self-control and to conform them to God's righteous standard apart from salvation, uh, which, which comes, his righteousness comes with salvation, if you don't get that, then you're facing judgment. They would be required to stand before God and answer for every evil deed they ever committed. Well, was Paul afraid of offending Felix and Drusilla? I see this all the time. People, you know, we get some famous Christian person on television and they've got some famous Christian personality on television interviewing him and they lighten up on the gospel because they don't want to sound too bad. And Paul doesn't. That's how you share with the rich and famous. By the way, what does it say um, in verse 25? Felix was afraid. And he says, get out of here. He says, I'll, I'll come when there's a more convenient time. When Felix realized he might have to face the judgment of God, this thought alarmed him. The result was not a quick conversion. Instead, Felix hastily dismissed Paul. And he said at the end of the verse, when I have a convenient time. And as far as we know from history, he didn't. Well, basically, how does God keep his church working? I mean, here's Paul, has this big witnessing opportunity, they reject it. So does he get discouraged and say, oh, I should have been easier on him? No. God's way of working with the church is always the same. God refills us with his spirit. He re-empowers us to be bold, and he pours out on us his great grace. And all the church is supposed to do is pray. So what I thought we'd do to get ready for communion, this is going to be a great communion. Let's all stand. And the elders and deacons are going to start filing out to go get ready to serve us. But we're going to stand. And as we stand here, this is an old-fashioned hymn that was written a long time ago that captures this refilling, re-energizing, and, and re-emboldening believers. And if you want to be like those first century believers that just did amazing things. The only thing different between us and them is we're the same, in fact, we have longer lifespans than they did and we have far more 
ease of transportation, communication, and technology, and everything else. But the only difference is that they were constantly, they were so excited about what they had at the beginning, they were constantly praying and allowing God to refill them. When's the last time you consciously, don't answer, but when's the last time you consciously cried out to God and say, fill me again. I don't want to live a day without your spirit filling and controlling my life. That's how they lived. That's how we should live. And this is a communion where we say, that's what we need. So to prepare for communion, let's sing this to the Lord. And, and you already know the words, so I invite you to do whatever you want to do. You can close your eyes, you can look up, you can do anything you want to. But let's just make this our prayer to the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Father, I pray that at this communion, that this bread we hold in our hands will be as real to us as it was to those disciples the very first time that you broke the bread and handed it to them and told them that as they ate this bread, they were to remember you. And every time in the future that they partook of this bread, they were to remember that you are the bread of God come down from heaven and that you suffered and bled and died and in your own body hung on the tree to take away our sin, to take our place facing the wrath of God and to give us the privilege of becoming your temples where you live and fill us as we just ask you to do. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would embolden us and that great grace would be upon us as we speak your word and live for you. This week and as much of this day as you give us to live, thank you as we celebrate, receive our worship in the name of Jesus. Amen.